Okay, so let's uh, open to Ezekiel 14 and try to go back, finish up uh, the book today, actually. Um, we, so we'd really have to kind of just uh, compress and go through the survey here. Uh, but Ezekiel, remember, is about God's presence. That's the main theme, is God's omnipresence is everywhere. His goal, his agenda for creation is to work in such a way that the earth will be full of his presence, that he is present everywhere, and that reality will happen. Um, and so we have Ezekiel's vision while he's in Babylon as an exile, and he's not able to be a priest as he turns 30. God says, well, actually, I'm present everywhere. And so he has Ezekiel act for him as a prophet to speak to Israel to warn them against their uh, sin and idolatry. And so, but the goal of Ezekiel 1 is that God is going to uh, fill the earth with his glory. Um, and, but he's going to do this by accomplishing uh, something else. Um, how does, so Ezekiel, uh, it falls on his face before God's glory in this vision. And he, God tells him to get up, but he's not able to. So what does God do for him? In Ezekiel 2, 1 and 2, what happens to him? from yesterday. How does God get Ezekiel up? He set him on his feet. Uh, he does stand him on his feet, but how? What does he do? Yeah, Fill him with the spirit. Yes, he fills him with uh, his spirit. So this is one of those key aspects of uh, the vision where Ezekiel is participating, showing what is necessary is God needs to fill people uh, with his spirit. That's how God is going to uh, facilitate filling the earth with his, uh, with his glory, okay? And, uh, and having that rule over creation as depicted in Ezekiel 1, okay? So Ezekiel is going to act as God's prophet, mouthpiece, to warn them. He does this through different signs. Um, and then in chapter uh, 8 through 10, um, he goes and takes a vision tour of the temple that's full of idols right in front of God. And God's glory in chapter 10 uh, leaves the temple and, and goes away from the temple. And so that's a big you know, uh, sign of God's judgment that he's saying, I'm, I'm still present even relationally with you, but the symbol of my presence is, is gone. God exits. And so that's a, a big uh, issue that's going on there. And then in uh, the following chapters, uh, he's uh, warning the people that their, their mediators are going to be cut off. Okay? So the different roles that have uh, access to God and have uh, helped the people commune with God and follow God's instructions for worship, um, all of these have failed, and God says, now your access to me has been cut off. In chapter 13, there are false prophets. Ezekiel says not to listen to the prophets anymore because they are speaking their own mind, not what God has said. Uh, the priests fail. They have idols in the, the temple, and the idols in the temple are because of actually a deeper problem. So if you went in and cleared out the temple of the idols, um, they would probably... Uh, be brought back in because there's actually a deeper problem. There, why do they have idols in the temple? It's because they actually have idols where? In, their heart. in the heart, Ezekiel 14. And so the people and the priests have idols in their hearts, so the priests fail, the system of worship fails, and we're going to see that with the destruction of the temple. They're not going to be able uh, to fulfill the system of worship. And then the kings fail, the, the leadership that uh, mediates God's kingdom and his presence, they fail as well. Okay? And so in chapter 14, God says that the situation is so bad that he says, even if you had the best of the best to pray for you and mediate on God's behalf, God would still judge because it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be enough. It'd be too late. He says, look at Ezekiel 14.14. Uh, 14. He says, even though you had these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in its midst, uh, by their own righteousness, they could not deliver themselves, declares the Lord God. Okay, so he says, look, even if you had three kind of big Old Testament names, Noah, who was one of the only people that survived uh, God's judgment of the flood, Job, you know, God has that relationship with him, where Job is kind of one of the 
introductory books to the Bible and, and mediates on behalf of his friends. And uh, Daniel, who, who Ezekiel knows as the, the guy who is uh, in Nebuchadnezzar's court, but is obedient to God and has a relationship with God, uh, where Daniel prays for his people, that that wouldn't be good enough. Yeah? Uh, how much longer did Ezekiel take place after Daniel? It's uh, taking place alongside, it's oh. overlapping. So Daniel's probably older in Babylon at this time, and Ezekiel is, uh, is aware of him. That's kind of what's, uh, what's going on. And Ezekiel's in Babylon? Yes. So they don't, it, it, Ezekiel knows Daniel. We don't know if Daniel knows Ezekiel. <laughs> like, we don't know if they're like friends or whatever, because Daniel's in the court of, uh, of the king, so mm -hmm. he may not know him personally. But anyway, so, but he says, look, even if you had the best of the best, it's not going to be uh, going to be good enough. Okay, so this is a failure of all the leadership. And then in uh, chapter 15, God compares Israel to a vine again, okay, which is pretty common. And he says, you're basically like a vine that has been burnt on both ends and in the middle. And a vine is not even really good for heating a house like in a fire. And a vine is not even good wood to like make a peg to hang something on the wall. So he says, basically, all this generation is good for is to be judged, to be thrown into the fire. And that's what God says Israel at this time is like. Okay, so this you can think of passages like John 15 where Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches, right? And he talks about that if there's a branch that uh, does not bear fruit, it's taken away, thrown into the fire. It's, it's useless is what he is getting at there. Um, and so in chapter 16, God talks about his, his grace, his faithfulness to an unfaithful people, but in a pretty, um, I, I wouldn't say graphic way necessarily, but in a pretty... Uh, uh, bold, kind of transparent way. In chapter 16, uh, Israel's sin is described as a rebellious and adulterous wife in a way that is um, pretty detailed as far as their, their desire for false gods. Okay? So sometimes this, uh, this chapter gets um, even not read very much or skipped, uh, skipped over. Okay, and then in chapter 17, there's another parable of the two eagles in the vine. Hey, ladies, uh, let's uh, stop the talking that's distracting. Um, and then in chapter uh, 18, it talks about God's judgment of, uh, of the people um, along with, uh, with the individuals. Okay, so he's, during this time, people are starting to interpret God's judgment as um, somebody else's fault, okay? So they say, they bring in something that's partially true, but they, um, they're they blaming the consequences of, uh, of their own sin on other people. So they say, you know, why we're experiencing God's judgment is because of the sin of our ancestors. Our fathers have sinned. They, they quote Deuteronomy and say, our fathers have eaten sour grapes, which comes from Deuteronomy, and they say, but our teeth are set on edge, meaning we have to deal with the consequences. So they got to disobey God's sin, and we have to deal with the consequences, which is true in a sense that a generation sins, and then it has an, a spillover into the next generation. But God makes it very clear. He says, no, 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 I'm not judging you for just their sin. I'm judging you for your sin. And he makes it clear that they too uh, are guilty. He said, if you had repented, and turn to me, you wouldn't be experiencing this judgment even if your fathers had uh, been guilty of sin, which they were. And so in, in uh, Ezekiel 18, 4, this is where he says um, a phrase you guys probably know from Ezekiel, where he says, Behold, all souls are mine, the soul of the Father, as well as the soul of the Son, the uh, soul that sins will die. And he repeats this several times throughout Ezekiel 18. And he says, look, you're not going to be punished for somebody else's sin. Somebody's uh, in your family is not going to be punished for your sin in the sense that God doesn't, um, in a unfair way, attribute someone else's sin uh, to you or you to them. But he says, if you sin, you're guilty. And so he warns them, each individual, they sin, they will die. But he says, look, if you turn, if you repent, then I will uh, restore you. I'll turn it around. But they don't, 
Uh, they don't do that. And so what we see throughout here is the failure of the individuals, the group, all levels of leadership. In chapter 19, there's a lament for the princes of Israel. Um, and then in chapter 20, there's a review. God says, look, I've done all these good things for you. Why? What are you upset about? Are you upset that I rescued you from Egypt? Are you upset that I brought you into this land? Are you upset that I gave you the kings and the temple? Are you upset that, you know, he says this, this is all about your sin, not, um, not because of something that I haven't done uh, correctly, okay? And so, but God does uh, promise that he will bring them back. He will restore them uh, to the land. He will restore that relationship with them, and he will protect people um, through through the exile, it says he puts a mark uh, on the people that he protects. Okay, so um, we need to see something here in Ezekiel 21. After we've seen the failure of all levels of leadership that causes the kingdom to collapse and the temple to be destroyed, um, basically, how does this get resolved? God says, I'm going to restore you, but everybody fails. Okay, um, can somebody read Ezekiel 21, uh, verses 26 and 27? 21 verses 26 and 27. All right, yeah, Vivian, thank you. Thus says the Lord God, remove the turban and take off the crown. Things shall not remain as they are. Exalt that which is low, and bring low which is exalted. A ruin, 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 I will make it. This also shall not be until he comes, the one to whom judgment belongs, and I will go to him. Okay, so he tells them, he identifies two uh, hats here and that, that represent two jobs, okay? So he says, you guys are done. That, that my system with you is, is done as far as it goes. It's suspended for the time being, okay? So he tells them to take off um, what hats? The turban and the crown. Turban and the crown, okay? So crown is easy. Who wears crowns? Kings. Kings, okay. You guys know who wears the turban? The Levites, priests. The Levites, the priests. Yeah, uh, cross reference uh, Ezekiel, uh, not Ezekiel, Exodus 28, um, where it talks about the, the uh, garb of the priests and what they're supposed to wear. So he says the priesthood is done. Priests have failed. King is done. King goes into exile. Okay? So he says all this will collapse. And then he says it's going to be a ruin, and he repeats that three times, really emphasizing that it's, it's disaster. The whole thing is destroyed, everybody fails, and then he says, uh, until he comes whose right it is, or he to whom judgment belongs, as, uh, as Vivian said, and he says he will give it to him. The one who can unite them, uh, all these things, the prophet, priest, and king, uh, will come and, uh, and bring it all together, is the idea. So basically God says, I'm going to allow the whole system to collapse to show that only I can put it back together and restore, and you won't have um, really this system uh, again until Messiah comes. Okay, so, and, and this word, uh, him to whom uh, it belongs, or him whose right it is, is another way of saying Shiloh, like Genesis 49 talks about Shiloh, who comes uh, and everything, all the kingdom belongs to him. It's a messianic uh, term. Okay, so basically God shows it all fails, but it will be restored through uh, the Messiah, who will be the priest and the king. Okay. Uh, and be a prophet as well. He can unite all of those offices and fulfill them all. Um, so this is one of those uh, areas of scripture that shows us why, uh, why Jesus is so necessary because he, only he is the one who can uh, bear all these offices and get it right. Um, so, uh, and by the way, Israel hasn't had a king since the collapse of this kingdom. They've had a priesthood and a temple at times. But they, uh, they don't have a king until Messiah comes. And Messiah did come, and they, they rejected him. Right? So, um, so anyway, he goes on uh, after this to detail in 22 more of the sins of Israel. He compares in, in 23 these two. Um, he gives kind of an illustration of these two um, bad sisters who are, who are evil, who are promiscuous. And I you say that's kind of like how Israel is. Um, and then chapter 24, he says that, you know, your sin and the consequences coming from your sin make total sense. Um, we used to call it in our family, 
uh, like with somebody would uh, my uncle I think came up with this with his kids who are a um, little older than you guys uh, in their 20s but when they were little and they were doing something that was not right and then they got hurt or something they call that a natural consequence meaning something that it's like you didn't have to get in trouble you got hurt because of what you were doing that you knew you were supposed to right so um, so in Ezekiel 24, that same logic is kind of used. He says, it's like a boiling pot. It says, you know, you took, put a pot there that's on the stove that just keeps boiling, boiling, boiling. Eventually the pot's going to spill and boil over, right? That makes sense. So he said, well, you keep sinning and my judgment continues to simmer. It's going to boil over, right, is, is chapter uh, 24. So basically says Babylon's, you know, on the way. Right. It also in chapter 24, we won't uh, go over this too much, but Ezekiel is told that as a sign, God is going to allow his, uh, his wife to die so that Ezekiel will experience and represent the, the pain, the tragedy of exile. And he says, you're not allowed to cry. You're not allowed to mourn. You're not allowed to, you can, you know, he knows he's going to feel how he's going to feel, but, uh, and Ezekiel is not, not happy with this. Um, but he says, look, this is, you know, this is going to be a, a sign to Israel that our relationship is, uh, is over. They're going into exile, um, that this is a very serious thing. And, and Ezekiel is going to have to experience, uh, experience this. And, and it, it, his relationship with his wife isn't like he doesn't care. He, he's called like, uh, she's called like the, um, the beauty of his eyes, the wife of his youth. So it's it's not like, a, and they, you know, he's a young guy. It's not like they um, they probably married a number of years. But um, so this is very painful uh, in Ezekiel's life. And uh, from here on, twenty five through thirty two, we have this judgment of the nations. God says, "Look, I'm going to judge you, but don't think that I'm not in control of the nations. I'm going to judge them as well." Okay, so, and then the continual phrase, by the way, that God repeats over and over and over again throughout the whole book of Ezekiel is he says, then you will know that I am the Lord. He says this throughout the, really the whole book. Uh, every time he does something, he says, then you will, you will realize, then you will know, then the nations will know that I am the Lord, right, when I have done this or that thing. Okay. So he lays out the judgment of the nations. Um, he even says that the judgment of the nations even judges the power behind the nations, right? So when there are evil rulers, um, who, what power is influencing and animating and behind them? Satan. Satan. Yeah, so it's, it's satanic, right? When people um, act in a way that's disobedient to God, at the root of that is you know their own <clears throat> sin nature, but... Also, there is satanic influence. And so in Ezekiel 28, the king of Tyre basically says, I'm a god. I'm, you know, I'm in charge of everything. And God says, I'm going to use Babylon to judge you. But then uh, the king of Tyre starts, God starts talking to him in a way where he's, it sounds like God is talking to Lucifer, talking to Satan. He says, you know, you were beautiful in Eden. You had all these things, but your heart, you know, you were proud. You sinned and you fell. Right? So it's like, why does he, God sound like he's switching talking for, to the king of Tyre to talking to Satan? Well, that's because he's talking through him to the power that, that uh, he's talking to the king of Tyre and using his, him in his, as an example. And God's talking through him to the power that's behind him and says, look, God is going to overcome evil that animates all um, evil rulers. But through this, Israel is going to be uh, regathered at the end of uh, chapter 28. God mentions that, mentions the judgment of Egypt, another powerful nation. Egypt is going to fall to Babylon, um, Assyria, all these other nations. God is going to bring them down uh, with Babylon. And then he'll bring Babylon uh, down as well. Okay, so then we get to a pivotal chapter in 33, where Ezekiel is told his job, he can't control whether anyone listens or doesn't listen or repents or doesn't repent. His job is to speak God's word and be a uh, watchman. Okay, so you guys understand back then you don't have a fire alarm. There was a watchman who was the fire alarm 
or the warning if a city was going to be invaded all of a sudden by an army. The watchman's job was to let everybody know there's a fire or we're being invaded, right? If the watchman sees something but doesn't say anything, then the watchman is guilty of what happens to that city. But if he's, what if the watchman says something, hey, there's a fire and nobody listens? Is it the watchman's fault? No. No. He's done the right thing. Whether the people listen or not is a different matter. And so that's what God says to Ezekiel. Your job is a watchman to warn the people so that when they're judged, they can't say that they weren't warned. And it's a great example for, um, or illustration for evangelism, that we can't control whether anybody get, repents, uh, believes in Jesus and gets saved, but have people heard from us who are unbelievers, friends, family that we know, have we been clear about the gospel uh, to the point where we've warned them and it's up to, they need to repent, it's up to whether God works on their heart, but um, can they say, well, wait a second, you never told me about this, you know, even if they uh, wouldn't have accepted it. Okay, so Ezekiel is told to be a watchman, then he's told in uh, verses 21 and following of 33 that the, just Israel, Jerusalem has now been taken, captured, uh, and the temple is now destroyed. Okay, so this is a paradigm shift for Israel because the temple represents God's relational presence with them, the symbol of his kingdom. It's been around since the days of Solomon. So you guys even remember months back in this class talking about uh, Solomon and his building of this great temple. And they thought, as long as we have the temple, it's not so bad. God will not destroy his own temple to judge us. And they talk about this in Jeremiah 7. They're like, we're good as long as we have the temple. Well, God allows the, a pagan nation, worse than Israel, to come in and destroy the temple and take them into captivity. They now cannot offer sacrifices. They can't obey the law of what God's called them to do. They're not in the land. And so now it's like God's relationship with them has been fundamentally changed. Okay, so now the bad thing that has been uh, promised, the judgment that has been coming for a long time, has actually happened, um, and the temple temple gets destroyed. Okay, but Ezekiel, remember, his whole idea is that the whole earth is going to become. Uh, there is going to be a new temple, as we'll see at the end of Ezekiel, and the whole earth is going to become uh, God's temple. Okay, so it's God is still saying, "Look, I'm present everywhere. I don't need a building, um, but the building is an important symbol." Okay, now we get into kind of the good news section of uh, chapter 34 and following. Okay, so we're making pretty, uh, pretty good progress here. Can somebody read um, Ezekiel 34 too? Because God's going to tell us what the problem is and then how he's going to resolve it. Uh, yeah, Macy. Um, 34 2. 34 2, please. Um, son of man, prophes um, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy. Uh, Oh, prophecy and say to the sh prophesy and say to the shepherds, thus says the Lord, woe shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves, should not the shepherds feed the flock? Okay, so he God is going to give judgment against the leadership again, but he calls the leadership what? He says the leadership are bad what? Shepherds, yep. He says that all these leaders are categorized as bad shepherds, right? So shepherds are obviously in the Bible a symbol of, of leading uh, people, right? Whether they're a prophet, priest, king, judge, whatever else may be the case. He says all of these shepherds are bad shepherds. They mislead the people. They do injustice against the people. They lead them in false worship. They lead them in national sin. And so... All the uh, human leaders fail. And so G God says in um, 34, um, 10, he says, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will demand my sheep from them, right? And make them stop, uh, you know, doing these bad things to my sheep. Um, can somebody read 3411? So it talks about how, how God is going to resolve this problem of the bad shepherds. Yeah, uh, Bryn? For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. Okay, so, uh, and can you read um, 
12 as well, 34, uh, 11 and 12. As a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is come, when he is among the scattered sheep, so I will care for my sheep and I will deliver them for all the places which they are scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. Okay, so God says, everyone's a bad shepherd. I'm going to stop them from being shepherds. And God himself says he will do what? Act as their what? Shepherd. shepherd. God says, I will be their good shepherd. I will come deliver them. This is uh, very common. I, uh, Psalm 23, obviously, the Lord is my shepherd. Um, Isaiah 40, God says, I will gather my lambs. Um, Micah uh chapter 2, Micah chapter 7, God says, I will act as their shepherd, okay? So God says, I will be their shepherd. No one else is able to, uh, to do it. They all fail, therefore I will do it myself. Um, but he also blends this with, um, with the Messiah. Uh, can somebody read uh, Ezekiel thirty four twenty three? This is how God will be their shepherd. So we know that God will be their shepherd, but in what expression? Yeah, uh, Vivian, go ahead. And I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. Okay, so he says uh, this verse identifies how God will be their shepherd is through one shepherd, my servant. Uh, one shepherd, my servant. Okay, so remember, I'm going to add in here uh, this, this term, uh, servant. Okay, because remember Isaiah, right? Suffering servant. Uh, and then he nicknames him David. Okay, so obviously this is the, the Messiah. Okay, John 10, 11, Jesus repeats this multiple times, but he says John 10, 11, he comes and says, I am the good shepherd, right? So Jesus is identifying himself as uh, the shepherd who would be God in the flesh, who would be the true king, who would save um, his people and lead them. One of the reasons why they're so offended is, one, because Jesus is claiming to be God. This goes along with um, Micah 5.2, where it talks about the one from Bethlehem will be act as their shepherd, like God acts as their shepherd. Uh, he uses an I am statement to call himself a good shepherd. But he also says, um, you know, based on Ezekiel 34, if Jesus is the only good shepherd, all the other leaders uh, that Jesus is talking to and about are what? Right. Bad shepherds. He's saying, you, you guys are a bunch of thieves and robbers who, who don't care about the sheep. But he says, I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep. Okay, so G, they are, Jesus is not only saying that he's, uh, he's God in the flesh, but he's saying, I'm your true king and I'm the only one uh, who gets this right. Um, and so he, he's come to, to save his people as a good shepherd. So yeah, it enriches your reading of the New Testament when you read, okay, well, what does it mean Jesus is a shepherd? Um, this is what he's talking about, this type of shepherd from Ezekiel uh, 34. <clears throat> and he's nicknamed David. He's going to be the king uh, like David, but in a greater, uh, greater way. And Jesus even says, I will gather all my sheep, and they will be one flock with one shepherd, which is the quote uh, from Ezekiel. Okay. In chapter 35, um, like Obadiah uh, talked about the judgment of Edom, chapter 35 uh, talks about the judgment of a particular area of Edom to show that if God judges this enemy nation of Israel, he will also do everything else he said and judge uh, the rest of the, uh, the world. Uh, chapter 36. Very key chapter, because here is where we get the statements about God's new covenant with his people. And there are a few aspects that we focus on, but I want us to take note of the fact that the new covenant has consequences beyond just uh, salvation. The new covenant happens now through Jesus in the church, but it will have consequences once Israel res uh, repents they will be returned to the land, is what Ezekiel and the other prophets say. And they give specific geographical boundaries of where. Um, so I, I don't want us to just focus on these parts. I mean, that's relevant to us because of our personal salvation. Um, so we should. But we need to keep in mind that there's a fuller fulfillment of the, the new covenant that will still happen in the world that God has not uh, finished fulfilling yet, if that makes sense. Jesus will come back, the, his people will turn to him, they will be saved, 
God will rescue them and bring them back from exile to the land. Okay, so uh, can somebody read Ezekiel 36, uh, 25 through 27? Uh, yeah, Pippi, thank you. I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness. And from all your idols I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will, will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Okay, so key aspect of the new covenant that Ezekiel identifies, he identifies two main things. Um, I mean, you can, you can maybe split into three. He talks about God's going to cleanse you from your filthiness, from your idols. Okay, that includes the idea of forgiveness of sins. That's going to be the big key part of the new covenant. Uh, Jeremiah 31 will talk about that, that there's going to be a final forgiveness of sins. But there, uh, Ezekiel focuses more on cleansing and presence. And so he talks about you will be transformed in the new covenant from the inside out. You have a bad heart. You have idols in your heart. God will provide in this new covenant a new heart, a new spirit, a new attitude uh, and mindset toward God that causes you to love God, respond to him, where your heart was a stone, was a rock, was dead. Uh, now it is alive and responsive to God. So this is one of the ways... Um, People can know that they're saved. Sometimes you get saved at a very young age. It's hard to identify. It's kind of like, well, it may, you may not be able to see it in such a dramatic way, but has your heart changed from opposing God and wanting nothing to do with God to desiring to please God, follow God, serve God, uh, desire his, his word, his truth, love him, love his people, despite you know, the sin that's still in our lives? Right, so that's an, uh, an indicator of do you have a new direction in your in your life in your heart, um, and then also something that happens here that's that's unique. Uh, Abigail asked yesterday about like the the role of the Holy Spirit in the the Old Testament. Um, here is where it talks about the the unique piece of the new covenant is going to be the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, where God not only puts His Spirit. Uh, around his people or empowers them, but puts it within you and causes his people to obey. And then in 28, it says, you will live in the land. Okay, so that's not really for us, so we don't usually read that part, but that is uh, what God also promises as well. Because some churches, and they, uh, they're often Bible-believing teaching churches, but they'll say, well, the land promises of the Old Testament are kind of Put aside, and God is having a greater fulfillment worldwide through the church. Um, I think it, the prophets are pretty clear that God has promised a land uh, for for Israel because they still continue to give borders and things like that um, and descriptors. Okay. Um, another vision that ties this together is the vision of the Valley of Dry Bones in Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel is dropped in this, in this desert with dry bones and he's told, preach to the bones, which is, you know, what's the point? You can't preach to bones. I mean, there's, you can, but they're not going to do anything. Well, that's because God has to act. So Ezekiel preaches to the bones and God raises the bones to life, puts skin back on them, does an act of resurrection, but they're not alive until God sends the wind, his spirit, to fill them and bring them back to life. And therefore, he shows what, even though Israel's relationally dead, I will resurrect them, bring them to life, and put my spirit in them, and they will uh, live before me. They will have, so you need a new heart, and you also need resurrection. You can think about New Testament passages that borrow this um, idea. Uh, Paul in Ephesians 2 talks about, even though we were alive, you were dead in trespasses and sins. Your heart was hard. It was unresponsive to God. God had to make you, if you're a believer, alive with Christ. He had to, he had to intervene, change your heart, make you pass from death into life. Uh, Jesus also talks about this in John 5, 25, when he talks about uh, the time is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of God and will live. Okay, so that's going to happen at the end of time as well, but it also happens spiritually in the people that God saves, that he, he resurrects, he brings you from death to life. Um, and so this is... Uh, Explained in 3711, it says, uh, these bones are the whole house of Israel. But this is going to be facilitated. This resurrection is going to happen because in 3724, 
He says, my servant David will be king over them and they will have one shepherd and they will walk in my ordinances and keep the, my statutes and observe them and then they will live in the land. Okay, so he says that the shepherd is going to facilitate resurrection. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. I lay down my life that I may take it up again, right? So the shepherd is the one who leads and facilitates the resurrection of God's people. So God solves the problem inside his people, but what still exists? So if God solves the evil inside his people through forgiving their sins, giving them a new heart, what's still a problem? He solved the internal problem, but what's the other thing? Well, it's the opposite of internal. External. external. There are still evil nations that resist God. And in uh, chapters 38 and 39, God says, I will judge them too. They will be gathered when I save my people. They will be gathered in opposition against me. And I will crush that opposition through the battle of Gog and Magog. In Revelation, in the New Testament, this is called uh, Armageddon. Okay, this is the Greek version of, uh, of this battle of resistance against God, Christ returns and kills uh, off this resistance. Okay, and um, then after that's all gone, Ezekiel 40 through 48, there is the, the final restoration where Israel is restored to the role of kingdom of priests that they were always supposed to be, the worship leaders of the world. Messiah builds a new temple, and there's a new Jerusalem, a new city built in a, uh, in um, Ezekiel 40 through 48. So you read these chapters and you're kind of like, well, this is a lot of like measurements and stuff. Okay. And so it's kind of like, do we need this? But he, he, Ezekiel is showing them there's hope for God rebuilding uh, this temple and then coming to uh, dwell with his people. Key verses. Look at uh, it, God's glory comes back into the temple. I'll just read Ezekiel 43, uh, 4, but note Ezekiel 43, 1 through 4, where God's glory comes back where it had left. And in Ezekiel 43, 4, he says, And the glory of Yahweh came into the house by the way of the gate, uh, facing outward to the east. So he's, and then it talks about 43, 5, uh, Behold, the glory of Yahweh filled the house. Okay, so now God's glory returns. Um, there are sacrifices that take place in this system, but they are not sacrifices for sin. They're sacrifices of celebration and consecration. There's no Day of Atonement anymore. So Jews had a hard time accepting Ezekiel for a while because they're like, this isn't the system of the law. It's missing the Day of Atonement. Well, the Day of Atonement isn't necessary anymore because of Jesus' forgiveness of sins. Um, one quick thing before we wrap up here with just the last verse of Ezekiel, you guys can turn to uh, Ezekiel 48. The video talked about, you know, some take this as, as literal, uh, like this is a real building that Jesus is going to build. Some people take this as figurative, symbolic language. I think the problem with it being figurative, symbolic language is it has measurements. You don't really need measurements if you're talking about a symbolic reality. But if you're talking about a physical building, you have measurements. And so that's what's, what's going on here. Um, God's glory comes, fills the temple. His glory fills the whole earth. There's a renewed creation. People actually worship God now and have a new heart. Israel is the kingdom of priests. Messiah is reigning. And then can somebody read just the last verse of Ezekiel? Ezekiel 48, uh, 35. Uh, yeah, Sophia? The circumference of the city shall be 18,000 cubits, and the name of the city from that time on shall be the Lord is there. Okay, so now the city is renamed, rebranded. Yahweh is there. The Lord is there. So God's presence is fulfilled. At the beginning of the book, People are asking, is God still with us? Is his presence still with us? And God says through Ezekiel, here's what I'm going to do to restore you. And then your city is going to be rebuilt. The temple is going to be there. And your whole brand, your whole name is going to be the Lord is there. Okay, so uh, that's Ezekiel. We've got a 